Hey everybody, it's Amy Graham, the Badass Valkyrie, and this is the Finding 52 Focus for the week of August 16th, and it is the 33rd week of 2021. And this week's focus is, how do you fit? <laughs> and I will give a little bit of background into why this is this week's focus. I have been trying to figure out how to get my miles, how to uh, make sure that I meet my goal of a thousand miles by the end of the year. And I have been as much as I can with our air quality and tear is, or not tear, that's a little sippy bean back there, getting her little spot. Um, figure out how to do this with the hip pain and the back pain that I'm enduring right now. And also coupled with that is the horrible air quality. We have, you know, it got a little bit better for a couple of days and then we ended up having a huge fire. It's still going on. It's not contained at all. And so there have been issues <laughs> and it is frustrating to me that you know, I feel like I get on this path and then something happens and it doesn't work. And I'm like, how many more times do I have to figure out how I'm going to do this? And this morning, uh, I had to go into the office and even though, you know, technically we're working from home, but we're getting some things uh, installed at the office. So I needed to be there and I just hit on a random podcast to listen to on my drive in. And it happened to be a uh, rich rolls podcast. And he was interviewing Courtney Dewalter. I had never heard the name Corey or Courtney Dewalter until this morning. And I can tell you right now, she is my spirit animal. I am so enamored with this person right now because the the whole interview um for those of you who don't know who she is like me she is an ultra marathoner and she is also listed as one of the top 50 athletes in the world and she runs these long races now not only has she run 100 mile races. She's run 270 mile races. She's done 300 mile races. And I'm just like, how is that possible? I didn't know people could, I mean, I knew about the 100 mile races. I never knew more than 100 mile races even existed until this morning. And the way she talks about it was very reminiscent of the way I talk about fighting and how I had to adapt myself into this community and fight for myself when <laughs> there was <laughs> she's digging down behind me and now she's like tickling my butt. She's like, hey mama. And so if she pops her head up somewhere weird, we'll just go with it. Um, but when I started fighting, I was the biggest female in the, the world fighting at that point in time as far as body mass. There was one other fighter who was a Belgian fighter and she was probably, she was well over six feet tall. And we called her Brienne of Tarth because it was like, Wow. Okay. I, I guess I'm the one that's taken her out. And so, uh, interestingly enough, after the first year, she didn't fight again, sadly. And she was, she was phenomenal. Um, some of my best fighting memories have her in that. So, um, sorry, little carpet shark there is going crazy. But listening to Corey talk about how, or Courtney, I keep calling her Corey and it's Courtney. 
how she talks about her approach to running these hundred or hundreds mile races made me realize something about myself. And in everything that I've done from who I am to how I've done things, how I've done sports, how I've approached my marriage, how I've approached fighting in general, how I've approached pretty much anything in my life, it has never been the norm because I've always been outside of the norm. Whether it was due to my size, my gender, my race, and I just never let that stop me. And in fact, sometimes that spurned me more because when I was one of seven women from the United States to go and fight for the first time, it's like, no one's telling me I can't. No, that, that is not part of the scenario. I don't care. I will fight. And so bucking the norm was what I did. And even when I was 450 pounds or above, I was still in armor. I was not running anywhere. <laughs> and it took every ounce of willpower that I had to get across a field. But by God, nobody could knock me down. I'm like, come on. How many y'all is going to take to try to push me over? Let's just see. And it was, I, I was basically a portable wall. And I reveled in that. I was like, bring it. And when that went away, I was like, oh, now I have to change. I have to adapt how I look at what I am doing because that's not going to work for me anymore. A little foreshadow, just so you know. Um, when I was fighting, I had, I could not armor up like the men, even though I was wearing men's armor, I had to make changes to the style and to the actual kit itself, which the whole like suit of armor, for those of you who don't know, we call that a kit. And so I had to adjust. I mean, I was as big as most of the men. That worked great. But I had my pontoons and boobs. <laughs> and while I could flatten out my chest and not worry about it, the pontoons, which for those of you who don't know that, is the overhang of my tummy that lays on the upper part of my thigh. So it's called the paniculus or the panis. And that's what I'm trying to get removed. But when you see somebody that is an apple on a stick, like I am, I carry all my weight in my middle section. It does not go down to my legs. My legs have always been extremely muscular and I've had great calves. And while they are not little, they are just solid. And one of the one, you know, two things that, you know, when somebody says, what, what part of your body do you love? I'm like, I always love my eyes because they were green. I always love my nose because it was just plain. You know, it wasn't too big or too small. It was just right. And I love my calves because no matter what, they were always muscular. And I would have runners and athletes, even when I was 450 pounds, come up to me and go, how did you do that? How did you, how did you get your legs like that? And I'm like, I'm carrying 450 pounds around 24 hours a day. <laughs> and they're like, no, but did you work to that? And when I went to the gym and I lost all my weight, then guys were coming up to me all the time because I would be doing some of the exercises to strengthen my calf muscles, not because I wanted them to get bigger, but because I needed them to still be viable and not rip. 
And when I was going through physical therapy for various injuries, um, I would have to do certain exercises and they would come up to me, please tell me what you're doing right now. Got you those calves. And I'm like, mm, no, sorry. And so I was always proud of that though. And you know, some people don't have shapely legs. I love my legs so much. So I always had to adapt my armor to fit my body. And so, because I couldn't adapt my body to my armor. And so I changed my kit and had specific pieces made because as much as you could find off the shelf armor, most of it was made for men. And I have very shapely calves. And so I literally had to send casts, plaster casts of my legs to get them made so that they fit a specific way. And because I couldn't just go buy a set of armor and it was gonna work, because it wouldn't. And I mean, I did that with my gloves. My gloves were, um, made their, it was the traditional regular size. And the, the guy that makes them is, he made them in one size only because it was the average size of, man, of a man's hand. And a lot of our female fighters were putting their hands at risk because they, their hands were too small. And I was like, I love these so much because they just fit, they were just right. But I could never have that just rightness in my calves. So I had to have them custom made. And so I adapted that and I made the armor work for my body. I go into all of that because during this podcast, she talks about what she does to prepare and how she monitors her body to do all of these hundred or hundreds mile races. And I go into that to say, spoiler alert, she doesn't really plan ahead. There's no grandmaster plan of, I have to do this many miles today, 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 to hit a hundred mile race. She said, I wake up, I kind of figure out where my body is, how I feel. Then I'm like, you know, I don't know that I could handle, you know, such steep inclines. She lives in Golden, Colorado. And so she has different trails that she runs and all of this to just kind of prepare. But she does it, you know, almost every day. And she's like, if my body's run down and I know that I don't have to get out on the, on the trail, I will let my body rest. She goes, I just kind of listen to what my body is telling me. And then I adapt my running plan to that. And when I heard that, I was just like, <sighs> and, and Rich Roll, who is also an ultra marathon runner, um, he's done some incredible feats as well. And he's like, so many people's minds have just exploded. And he was meaning it in the, the ultra marathon community because, you know, there are so, I mean, he goes, there are very specific things that you do to prepare your body to run like a marathon. But not as much to do like a hundred mile race. And I'm like, how is that possible? <sighs> and then to go on and she has, she did um, Big's Backyard uh, Ultra and it, she ran 279 miles, 279 miles. Who does that? I'm like, 
taking a year to work myself up to a marathon, hopefully, hopefully. And I'm like, there, you don't even follow a plan. She, she eats what she wants, but, but then again, if you're running hundreds of miles in races, you can do that. But she doesn't take supplements. She doesn't, she's just like, I do what my body tells me I can do. She goes, my feet just carry me through. And her outlook on this whole thing, and she's, she's not like this 20 something, you know, ultra athlete, you know, she's 36. And like, you look at her and you're like, that's a hippie chick. She's just like, Hey guys. And she's just so happy. And she's like, I, I, I don't let it get me down. And she talks about what she calls the, the cave pain, the pain cave. And she goes, I actually look forward to getting into that point of a run where my body is like, dude, we need to stop. We need to stop. You no, no. And she's like, so I just visualize, you know, when I'm running and it's like, I'm in the pain cave and I am literally got a chisel and a hammer and I am making that cave bigger. And I was just like, wow. And it, it made me laugh because I'm like, there is no hammer or chisel big enough that could ever put me into that kind of mold <laughs> to be an ultra runner. And, and it kind of occurred to me that I'm like, wait a minute. And I had an epiphany. The, this whole time of running, that I've been doing over the past, well, since 2011. I, that's when I first started, all right, I'm going to do this running thing and see what happens. And so I started, I started very small. And because I had not been raised as a runner or an athlete of any sort, I was band geek, which in their own right, they are an athlete because you have to be super coordinated to be able to be a marching band flat out. Bite me <laughs> if you think that is incorrect. But I always followed all of these specific things. And I'm like, well, I can't, I can't do that. I can't do this. I can't do that. I'm like, my body doesn't let me do this. I can't. I can't chip away enough to fit into this runner mold. And so I might as well just give up. And I was just blown away by how easily I was defeated. Because up until this morning, I'm like, well, now I have to ride my bike more than I had ever planned on before because my body is just not cooperating. And I have to, you know, suck it up and adapt and just one more thing that I'm going to fail at. And it's not fair. And it's pissing me off that I'm not going to be able to do this the way I wanted to do it and the way I'm supposed to do it. I, I did not realize that I had not been applying the, if it doesn't fit, figure it out and adapt the race or the goal to my body, not adapt my body to the race. So that's why I ask, how do you fit? Because are you trying to put yourself into this tiny little mold that may not ever fit? I have done it with um, 
planning. And I do what works for me. I use the bullet journal method in a Hobonichi planner. And if you hear tinkling in the background, it's my husband putting cereal in a bowl. <sighs> but I digress because there are times that I, <laughs> I am downstairs gaming and I'm like opening a bag of chips and he's on a call and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, they don't care. Just as I'm sure many of you didn't care and probably wouldn't have even heard it or noticed it, except I just had to give him just a little bit of grief for it. Anyway, but I have been trying to fit me into what the ideal runner is supposed to be. Even to the point of, well, I'm not even a good, good Athena athlete anymore. No, no. Now, do I expect to ever PR or to podium, which means getting first, second, or third place? No, but I never did in the first place. My first triathlon, I was the last person to cross the finish line. But you know what? Still a triathlete. And so I did the triathlon the way I had to do it because I'm not a strong swimmer. I had issues with my bike, most of all, because I didn't know how to do the gears. And so I kept my bike in one gear the entire race. After that race, my husband's like, why didn't you just change gears when it got so hard? I'm like, I don't know how to do that. He's like, what? I'm like, I never grew up with bikes that had gears. So I don't know how to do that. So I just left it in one. I figured it'll be easy. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. He's like, oh my God, <laughs> you were doing hills in the same gear. I'm like, yeah, because I don't know how to make it go up or go down or how I'm supposed to go up or go down. I have since learned that. <laughs> and boy, does that make a difference. But at the time, I didn't know how to do it. I probably would not have been last had I actually worked on learning how to use the gears in my bike. But I had got the bike, you know, four weeks before the competition. And I borrowed it from my brother because I realized that my uh, hybrid bike was going to be way too heavy. And so he's like, well, I have this bike. Do you want to just use it? And I'm like, yes. That would be awesome. And I was still learning how to swim properly. And when I say properly, I'm like, it took me six months. No, not six months, three months, roughly, of just putting my face under the water, taking it out. Putting my face under the water, taking it out. Just so I didn't have a panic attack. So I did the triathlon my way the only way I could have done it. And I, I, that's how it went. My first mud race was a Spartan. By the way, you should never have, you know, an endurance and mud race be your first. But I dive in head first usually. I did not realize a lot of things about the Spartan. Namely, that I would be going through vats of water that had soil and fertilizer and all of this stuff that grass is all mixed into and having sweat open up my pores and then diving into this vat of contagions basically almost killed me. And I did not know why. And then I'm explaining what happens and she's like, hold on, aren't you allergic to grass? And I'm like, well, yeah, but I didn't put my face down in the grass. You know, I, I did, you know, squats instead of push-ups. She goes, you realize you're not diving into like a pool. 
right? And I'm like, well, it's just water in this big trench that they dug. And so I had to go underneath and in, into this thing. And I, then, and she's like, and your mud thing that you did halfway through. I'm like, yeah, it's just like this big trench. And I said, but it's mud. Ding, 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 ding. Filled with grass, filled with fertilizer, filled with seeds, filled with everything that my body did not need to have. And so it took me almost three months to recover from that because I had basically soaked my body into all of this stuff that I'm allergic to. Yay! So I know now that I cannot do a mud race or a Spartan. Mud races are pretty much out regardless, but I could still do a Spartan if it was in the arena. And so like going to like Denver Stadium and doing the mud or doing the Spartan race there. I have not looked into it deep enough to know, you know, do they bring in, you know, the, what types of obstacles I would actually have to go through. But needless to say, it's not in a farm field in the middle of Idaho. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, did you think they like brought in these, these pools and that you had, I'm like, I didn't know. I didn't know. That was the end of the thing. And so I had to finish. And so I did. And of course it took us, you know, another hour to get into town. And then I'm, and we're celebrating and all of that. And so all of this stuff is just basically marinating my body. So yeah, lesson learned just like the lesson learned for my triathlon. But I go into all of this because in the back of my mind, I felt like I had to conform to all of these different rules to be a runner, even to be an Athena runner. And I'm like, you know, when my friend Matt, you know, let me know that he was going to walk his Iron Man. And I'm like, you can do that? He's like, yeah. And you're still an Iron Man. And I'm like, whoa. Because I've had all these preconceived notions of what runners are supposed to be. And it occurred to me <laughs> that I had been trying to chip away just enough to get into that mold. And I've never done that for anything else in my life. I'm like, I'm going to live by all my own rules. And it gave me a sense of hope because I'm like, okay, if this ultra athlete who is questionably the one of the best female runners in the world can do this without a plan, without listening to all of the different devices and everything else. And, and that's, that was one of the other things that Rich Roll was talking. He goes, you don't use the heart monitor? He goes, she's like, no, no. She goes, I wear a watch so that I can, you know, know where I might be, it has GPS on it. And it, she goes, it has like a heart rate thing, but I never pay attention to that. I never look at it. And he's like, <sighs> I'm sure Garmin really appreciates the fact that, you know, you've just said, it doesn't really matter. And it made me giggle because I'm actually looking into getting a Garmin, not because of all the fancy bells and whistles mostly, but because of it has incident detection and it pains me. <laughs> it pains me to know that that is the reason I'm investing hundreds of dollars, like almost $600 into a watch to run, ride and roll or whatever, swim, whatever, this one I can't swim in 
regardless because it's not waterproof. Um, but it has incident detection. So if I fall off my bike, if I trip or my hip gives out and I fall and I've knocked myself out, um, it will send a message to Greg within 30 seconds saying there has been an incident and it will, it will transmit my location to Greg. And <laughs> Greg's like, yes, we're getting that. Do you want it now? We can, we, we can get it now. Do you want that? And I'm like, this is something I want to do for me on my own. So it'll take a couple of paychecks, but that is the reason I'm getting it because I cannot no longer trust my lower back and my hip. Uh, there have been too many times that I have caught myself because my hip has given out. And so we're to that point. But I also know that I can slow my race or slow my pace down my race. <laughs> I ain't racing nobody <laughs> except people with walkers right now. <laughs> but I can slow my pace down and I can even out and I can pay attention. And that's what I have been doing, even though it was kind of subconscious, because as many of you know, I've been doing uh, the Galloway method for my running, run, walk, run. And for the past couple of months, it's been mostly walk, a little jogging when I can, but because of my pain levels, I have felt like an utter failure. And like I said, I couldn't chip enough away to fit into that mold anymore. And now I'm like, well, let's just flip that up and do what you normally do and make the running fit you not the other way around. And I don't know why I had that kind of mental block with that. Um, it's kind of, you know, when, when I started fighting, it was like I was doing it on my own terms because I was the first group of females, I was with the first group of females that did that. And it's like, we're paving our own way, no matter what. And you know, with my gastric bypass and once I lost all my weight, I had to figure out ways my body worked and how I could do things with what I had. And I was adapting constantly, um, not just because my size was changing literally weekly, um, but to what I could do, how my endurance levels were going, how I could keep my endurance levels up and still maintain my nutrition and all of this stuff. But for some reason, I could not get it in my head that, no, you fit the race to you, not trying to fit you to the race. And I just, I don't know why fundamentally that was a block for me. And so that's why I ask, how do you fit? Are you trying to do something the way it's supposed to be done? You know, I, I can't not even tell you how many times, you know, people are like, well, I can't do the bullet journal because I can't follow all of those rules. And I'm like, you know, it's your notebook, right? You get to do it however way you want to do it. And I do things differently. I make it work for me. That's, that's how I roll. <laughs> and I just, for some reason, wasn't making running work for me. I was like hell bent. I was like, I've got to increase my pace. I've got to do this. I've got to do this or I'm not a real runner. No, no. <laughs> I get my ass out the door just like everybody else. I tie my running shoes just like everybody else. So I have to figure out what running 
looks like for somebody like me, somebody who has osteoarthritis, somebody who has hip issues, somebody who has excess weight in places they, that may or may not ever get cut off. You know, I'm just like, okay, now let's figure out a way to adapt this and figure it all out. You know, I, I've always been proud of the fact that I've blazed my own trail. And yet, here we are, because I was forcing myself into this tiny little thing called running. And I was like, okay. And, and I felt like at certain points, I was like, okay, well, I'm going, I'm an Athena runner. That's what I am. But I, I mean, I do fit that completely, but I'm not really in the triathlon world as much as I wanted to be. And quite frankly, uh, working on, you know, just getting my body to function <laughs> kind of takes precedence over, you know, picking swimming back up or any of that. And thankfully though, that actually got me on a bike and I love it, but I have to adapt. And so I would like to eventually at some point in my life again, do another triathlon or more, but I've got to focus on doing running the way my body can run. And so I have to fit the race to me, not fit me to be the perfect race runner. I, I'm never gonna be that. Hell, I, I can only dream about 100 mile races and that's in a car. I, I, I could not, literally, I, I could not even imagine riding my bike for 100 miles. And my brother-in-law will do 100 mile rides a day sometimes. You know, he's like, I just went for a quick 100 mile ride. And I'm like, I hate you. <laughs> I don't, I love him dearly, but I just, I, I, I can't picture that. But then again, 10 years ago, I couldn't picture myself as a fighter, not the, at the level that I was competing at. Two years ago, had you told me that I was going to contemplate training for a marathon, I'd have been like, yeah, no, that's never going to happen. No, no. I don't want to ride 26.2 miles. I'm certainly not going to run it. No, thank you. But now I'm like, I kind of want to do that, but I want to do it safely and in as little amount of pain as possible, <laughs> but still have goals to try to reach towards. If I hit my thousand miles by the end of the year, I can tell you now it will not be fully run, but I can adapt. I can adapt that goal to what my body can do. And I had already done that to a, to a certain extent, but now I am listening to my body and going, okay, what are we up to today? What can we do today? Because if I project too much forward and can't do it, then it's just disappointment all over again. But if I listen to what my body can do on the days that it can do it, great. Does that mean that I'm not going to have that goal? No, no. <laughs> We've already discussed that. I have to have goals and ride, run, crawl, roll, whatever. I will, I will meet that goal come hell or high water, but it's going to look different. And so I'm adjusting that goal to what I can physically do. And who knows, after my next ablation, that pain could go away like it has in my neck so far. I could be back to running solid again after, you know, some ramp up again. But 
I'm not going to put my body through hell anymore trying to make it be this thing that it's not. And that's okay. So how do you fit? Whether it's planning, running, walking, life in general. Are you trying to fit into a mold that you feel like you're supposed to be in when really you get to make that whatever, whatever it is, that thing adapt to you. And I know that that's not the answer for everything, but it's the answer to a lot. And sometimes we go through life feeling like we have to fit into certain things, even when we have bucked that thing forever. I'm like, I am proud of the fact that I have walked to a different drummer than most people almost my entire life. But little things like that can worm their way in and you're like, well, there are set rules that you have to follow to be a runner. And if you aren't checking those boxes off, you don't get to be one. Well, guess what? There is no runner police. Period. You get to be whatever you want to be, however you're going to be it. If I go out and I never run another mile, but I walk it, I'm still a runner. Because in my head, I, not really even in my head, that is as fast as I can do it. And to me, that is my run. And so instead of setting myself up for failure, I'm like, okay, we're going to be the best runner 54 year old Amy can be. I'm going to be the best fighter 54 year old Amy can be. I also know that I am getting older every day, every day. As much as I don't want to say that it happens. All of us are every day getting older. And I also know that I've put my body through hell very much. So not just, you know, through fighting and running and all of that. There's that little issue of carrying 450 pounds for, you know, a large portion of my life. That's going to have some irreparable damage that I can't fix no matter what. So adapting and adapting the race to me, as opposed to adapting me to a race that I am never ever going to be able to fit into properly into that mold that that whatever it is, is, is wants me to be. I can't be that. I can't. I have to figure out now what that looks like as opposed to try, trying to chip away enough to fit that mold because I don't. And I have never thought of myself as someone that would try to do that. But it occurred to me today that I, that's exactly what I was doing. I was trying to be this imperfectly perfect runner, <laughs> even though there's no such thing. I just, in my head, that's what I felt like. And I was like, no, but I, I can do this. I can do this. I can do this. Well, why are you trying to take away things about you to fit whatever this is? Instead, take away things from this to make it fit you because you're the special entity, not the race. Anyway, I have gone on far, far, far too much about this, but that's what I want you to think about is how do you fit? Are you trying to fit yourself into somebody else's mold or are you trying to fit something else around who you are? Because that is the more ideal situation instead of chipping away pieces of you to fit somebody else's ideal. How about you chip away 
the, all of the parameters that everybody is expecting of you and give them new ones. How do you fit? That's the focus for this week. So there you have it. A little long-winded. Sorry. Got a lot of talking in me today. So I hope you guys have a great week and I will talk to you soon.